everyone. Welcome to our podcast. If you'd like more information about our church, you can visit www.r4sq.org. Okay, enjoy the podcast. How you guys doing today? Can I say there's no place like home? Of course, I've been out for the last couple of weeks. My wife and I had an opportunity to go and spend a couple of weeks away, and it was truly amazing. Uh, so wonderful to be able to go and, and, and know that uh, God's still God and that he still shows up when the pastor's not here. We have an amazing uh, staff of leaders who, uh, who just step up and just, just do what God, God's got us doing here. And it's just, I'm so thankful to, to be leading a church that is filled with such people that love Jesus and love people and, and are willing to just step up and serve uh, in whatever capacity is needed. So thank you all, those of you who, uh, again, who lead in this church, and those of you who call Restoration Church home, thank you for being here. And thank you for allowing me and my wife the opportunity to go off and just spend a couple of weeks <clears throat> getting some rest and relaxation. Uh, while I was gone, of course, my family grew by one. Have a new grandbaby. <laughs> and uh, I will ask that you uh, continue to pray for Ashley and for little Parker. Uh, she's still having some, some challenges regulating her body temperature. At about midnight, 1 o'clock this morning, Ashley, Ashley took her back to, uh, took her to the emergency room where they admitted her for a couple of days just to monitor her and keep her, you know, under uh, controlled temperature. But, but uh, she's doing fine. Pray for Ashley. Of course, you mothers that, you know, you understand what it's like that first time being a mom. <clears throat> how every little whimper just frightens you to death and every little thing is of great concern. But uh, so thank you again for, for praying for them and for stepping in when, 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 uh, when we were out. Um, technology is amazing. We did not miss the birth of our grandbaby because we was on Skype. So we, we're, we're in Europe, halfway across the world, watching the birth of our grandbaby. And, uh, and I told my wife, I was, honey, it's probably a good thing that you, we were not here. Because they probably would have kicked you out of the delivery room because she was just, oh, my God. But, uh, but again, it was an amazing time. And, and, uh, but there's no place like home. There's no one like family. And you guys are my family. And I miss you dearly. And I'm glad to be back. Well, today we're going to continue our series through the book of Romans. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure this is uh, our next to the last lesson. We, we plan on concluding Romans next week. Uh, today we're going to conclude Romans chapter 15. Of course, the title of our series is Nothing Will. So if you will turn with me to Romans 15, and we're going to read verses 13 through 21. And today I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I like the way the NLT puts it, so I'm using that translation. You can follow on the overhead behind me. If you like, <clears throat> I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I am fully convinced, my dear brothers and sisters, that you are full of goodness. You know these things so well, you can teach other all about them or teach each other all about them. Even so, I have been bold enough to write about some of these points, knowing that all you need is this reminder. For by God's grace, I am a special messenger for Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. I bring you the good news so that I might present you as an acceptable offering to God, made holy by the Holy Spirit. So I have reason to be enthusiastic about all Christ Jesus has done through me, in my service to God. Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked or I lived among you. They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. I've been following the plan spoken of in the scriptures 
where it says, those who have never been told about him will see, and those who have never heard of him will understand. Can we say amen to the reading of God's word this morning? Amen. Thank you, my brother. Well, today I'm going to speak a message to you entitled, Preach the Gospel. Preach the Gospel. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19, all of this, and he's speaking of the passing from the old life that we once had, into the new life that we now have in Christ. He said, all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the church, the body of Christ. He's given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. You know, all praise and all honor is to be given to God. For it is the Lord who brought, uh, uh, brought us back to himself by blotting out our sins and by making us righteous through the finished work of Jesus. And God, who reconciled us, now expects us to be, to be vessels of reconciliation to others. To be reconciled means to no longer be enemies, to no longer be strangers, or to no longer be foreigners to God. Isn't it great knowing that God is not your enemy? Isn't it great to know that you're not a stranger to God? But he's intimate with you? That you're not foreign to him? He knows exactly who you are and what you're going through? And now that we have been reconciled back to God, we have the privilege and the responsibility of encouraging others to receive that same reconciliation. You know, Francis of Assisi is believed to have said, preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. What he was declaring is that everything about our earthly existence should glorify God. Everything about your life should, should be a testimony of him. Everything about your life should speak of the goodness of God that you enjoy because you have been reconciled back to him through the finished work of Jesus. What he was saying is that we are to be living epistles of the gospel of Jesus. That our primary means of preaching, our primary means of declaring the good news it's by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us that we possess a life that is so given to Jesus that people are drawn to that life. Not, the, not that they're drawn to us, but they're drawn to the God they see in you. They're drawn to the life of God that they see you walking in. Let me tell you about my new friend, Jerry. My wife and I just returned from an amazing Mediterranean cruise. A cruise that began in Barcelona, Spain. We made a stop in Marseille, France. We made a stop in Dubrovnik, Croatia, which was just absolutely an unbelievable place. Love Dubrovnik. We made a stop in Corfu, Greece, and we made several stops in Italy. The day before we got on the ship, we were sitting downstairs in the hotel in Barcelona having a sandwich when we were approached by a middle-aged couple from Minnesota, middle-aged white couple named Jerry and Anita. 
they were so excited to meet us because they had spent the last day or so in Barcelona, Spain, feeling very lost because very few people speak English in Spain, or at least in Barcelona. In Dubrovnik, Croatia, almost everyone spoke great English, but it's required that they learn English. But Jerry and, and, and Anita, they, they were so excited to meet us, and, and they began to, to share the horror stories of their time in Barcelona. They were so glad to find someone that they could talk to, and they asked if we could ride together to the cruise port the next day. So the next morning, we took a taxi to the ship with them, and during the course of the cruise, we spent a lot of time with them. We ate together. We went on tours together. We just hung out. First night, we ate with them. I said grace, which we did each time. Although I I must admit to you, at times when I was saying grace with them, I hurried through it because I could tell it was something that they were not accustomed to doing. We learned a lot about them in a few short days. We learned about their family. We learned about their work. We learned about their neighbors. We learned about Jerry's recently deceased father who had raised him to be agnostic. But 25 years prior to his his father's passing, Jerry's father was baptized into Catholicism. Yet there was no evidence that Jerry had a relationship with Jesus. But during our time together, we began to see signs of movement towards God. Signs of God doing a work in them. Although, and please hear me, I never preached to them. Every time we would pass by church, Jerry wanted to stop and go in and take pictures. And they have some beautiful churches over in, the, in Europe. And one week into the cruise, we were in Corfu, Greece, where Jerry bought a, a new suitcase. And as we was walking through the streets of Corfu, he hands me his new suitcase. And he said, would you bless this for me? That night at dinner, Jerry joined us, but his wife did not. He showed up a few minutes late, so we'd already said grace and started to eat some freshly baked bread when he came and joined us. After sitting down for a few minutes and talking as we ate our bread, Jerry suddenly stopped and said, hey, we forgot to pray. Although we had prayed before he got there, I gladly prayed again because I wanted to capture that moment for Jerry. During our time together, I had another opportunity to pray for him, which he gladly received. And though I never got to the place of praying with Jerry for salvation, I know during our time together, Seed was either planted or watered that would one day lead to Jerry coming to know the love of Jesus. So will you, in your time of prayer, when you think about it, will you pray for Jerry and pray for Anita? Pray that God will work in their lives to draw him closer to them. What am I saying? What I'm saying to you is that God will bring people into our lives that he wants us to touch with the love of Jesus. He will bring people to us that do not look like us. They do not have the same values that we have, yet they are people in need of Jesus just like we were. And the greatest thing we could do for God is represent him with our lives. 
The greatest thing we can do for God is let our speech, our actions, our demeanor be a testimony of his saving grace. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And the Bible declares that that faith is not even of us, but even that faith is of God. In our text today, Paul starts out by saying, may the grace of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our God is the God of hope. And the people we come across, they should see hope in us. Our God is also the God of joy and peace. And the people we come across, they should see in us joy. They should see in us peace. Hope, joy, and peace are not just virtues to be expressed through our words, but they are virtues to be expressed through our lives. They are virtues that people are to see in us. For the Holy Spirit imparts to us not only spiritual gifts, but also he imparts joy. He gives us peace and he gives us hope. And in Romans 14, 17, Paul said, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, our dietary restrictions, however healthy they may be, may be of no proof that our life is one that is Holy Spirit-led. The observance of certain religious laws is no evidence that someone is walking close to Jesus, but a life. Everyone say a life. A life that is filled with righteousness. A life that is filled with peace, joy, and may I add hope speaks loud and clear to those who observe your living, there is something different about that person. There is something that they have that I don't. There is something they have that I need. And in Romans 15, 14, Paul said, a person with that kind of life is full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish or teach others. It is by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we admonish. It is by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we are to teach, we are to exhort, we are to counsel, and we are to reconcile others back to God. Listen, Christians, we should be the best counselor. Not because we're educated, not because we have a PhD, but because we know the will of God for our life. And we know the will of God for the life of all men. We should be the best counselors because we should be able to apply scriptures rightly to life and help others apply God's word rightly to their life. We do this not on our own, but we do it by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the grace of God that is at work in us. Romans 15, verses 15 to 17, Paul says, I've written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus the things which pertain to God. In other words, Paul never glorified in what he had done, but he glorified in what God had done through him. 
Being proud of God's work in and through you is not a sin. It is an act of worship to God. However, there's a fine line that separates pride in self and confidence in God. Fine line. Make sure you're on the right side of that line. But James tells us in James 4 verse 6 that God opposes the proud. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Paul said, it is by the grace of God that I am able to do what I do. Only by God's grace. In Ephesians 3, verse 7 and 8, he wrote, I became a minister according to the grace, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you hear what the Apostle Paul is saying? This man, who played perhaps the greatest role outside of Jesus in establishing the church, said, I do what I do for God only by God's grace. He was a man of humility. He knew what side of the line he was on. What about you? Do you fully understand that it is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you that truly makes a difference in the lives of others? Do you understand that the righteousness, the peace, the joy, and the hope that is in you is God's grace at work in you? Paul called himself less than the least of all the saints. And he said, it is only by the grace of God that I can even preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of God. Paul was a man of humility. I used to struggle with that. If I saw Paul as being brash, bold, right? Not only was he an apostle, he was very prophetic. And he'd get in your face. Ask Peter. (laughs) You get out of line, Paul will put you back in line. But he was still, he was a man of humility. Listen. Humility is simply trusting God more than you trust self. Humility is not that display or the lack thereof. Humility is not being soft-spoken. Humility is not making sure that you don't say anything that doesn't offend. Paul offended a lot of people. Did he not with his preaching? But it was the truth. But he was humble because he trusted in the grace of God. And not in Paul's efforts, ability, gifting, lineage, education. Let me share something else with you that I learned. When you have confidence in God working in and through you, things begin to happen that you cannot explain. Like someone who's been around you for a few days wanting you to pray over their luggage or say grace over dinner. And please hear me when I say this. I felt so unqualified to do those things. And I think I felt that way because in my mind, I had not preached to them. Are you tracking with me? I felt so unqualified. 
I felt like I was praying an empty prayer. Because I had not preached. Or had I? Please don't understand, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Don't think that I'm saying that we're not to preach to others the word of God. Preaching is my life. It's what I do. Preaching must be a part of the life of every believer. But we are to let the Holy Spirit lead us into what to say and how to say it. We're to let the Holy Spirit guide our actions. And we are to not be motivated by pride to do something that we can later gloat about. You see, if I would spent those first few days preaching to Jerry and Anita, when he asked me to pray for his suitcase, I would have thought, good job. My preaching got through. Do you follow what I'm saying? I had nothing to gloat about. I felt like I had failed God. In the natural, I felt like I had not done what I should have done. But by the Spirit of God, I pray that I did what God wanted me to do, and that was be a light shining bright to someone in need of spiritual hope. Romans 15, verse 18 says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit. What Paul is saying here is he only spoke what Christ had accomplished through him in word and deed. That is by proclaiming the truth and by demonstrating it in miracles and powerful answers to prayer and in his own examples of a Christ-like life. In these verses, 18 through 22 from the NLT says, Yet I dare not boast about anything except what Christ has done through me, bringing the Gentiles to God by my message and by the way I worked or I lived among them. They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's Spirit. And Paul said, In this way I fully presented the good news of Christ from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. He says, my, my ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard. And I've been following the plan, God's plan spoken of, of in the scriptures where it says those who have, have never been told about him will see and those who have never heard of him will understand. In fact, my visit to you has been delayed so long because I have been preaching in those places. Our president, Dr. Glenn Burris, uses this salutation in his correspondence until all have heard. That defines our mission. That describes our mission. It is to continue to preach the gospel through deed and through word until all have heard the good news. Because only when all have heard will Jesus return to get his bride. Only when all have heard will Jesus come to take us home. Paul concludes this chapter by asking for something for himself. He asked the saints in Rome to pray for him. 
as he continues the work that God gave him to do. Listen to what he said in verses 30 to 33. Dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to join in my struggle by praying to God for me. Do this because of your love for me given to you by the Holy Spirit. Pray that I will be rescued from those in Judea who refuse to obey God. Pray also that the believers there will be willing to accept the, the donation I am taking to Jerusalem. Then by the will of God, I will be able to come to you with a joyful heart and we will be an encouragement to each other. And now, may God, who gives us his peace, be with you all. Amen. You know, too often, church, we view prayer as simply a time for comfort, a time for reflection, a time for making our requests known to God. But here, Paul urges believers to join in his personal struggle. By means of prayer. Will you pray for me? I mean it. I need you to pray for me. I can't do what, what God's called me to do. Except by his grace. I can't teach what God has helped me teach except by his grace. I cannot speak to you what God wants you to hear from me except by his grace. Will you pray for me? I'll pray for you. This battle is real. Yet how easy do we lose sight of it? How easy do we get caught up in the things of life in just doing life, just trying to live one day at a time, making sure my bills are paid, making sure I could feed my family. And we forget that this is a struggle and that we need each other. I need you to pray for me, brother. Pray for me. Pray for my dog. Pray for my baby Ashley. You mama, you know what it's like to be the mama for the first time. Every little whimper, it scares her to death. She wakes us up at 1230 this morning and say, Mama, you got to come go with me to the emergency room. Parker's temperature is too low. So they headed out to the emergency room. She's there, going to spend the next two days in the hospital. She's fine. But can you imagine what that new mom felt? And can you imagine what I felt not knowing what I could do to help her? That's real life. That's real life. I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for my baby. Because life can be a struggle. But we win. But we win how? We win together. Together. Not, not alone. Not going at it on our own, on our own, doing it our own way, but being led by the Holy Spirit in all that we do. Prayer is a powerful weapon to be used in our armor as we intercede for one another in this fight against darkness. Two questions I have for you as I close. Number one, do your prayers reflect urgency? Are you urgent when you pray? 
Or is prayer just a matter of convenience? Or may I, maybe I should say inconvenience for you. Do you understand that you're in a warfare? Your children are in a warfare. Are your prayers, prayers of spiritual warfare that you know pushes back darkness and evil? Paul understood the the power of prayer and that even the prayer of those whom he had never met would be very effective in spiritual warfare. So he asked the believers in Rome, whom he never met, to pray for them. Pastor Jack Hayford wrote in a recent email these words about praying for one another. He said, we all need the body of Christ to pray. The number to whom we turn is not the issue. For the Lord our God can save by many or he can save by few. But this is the principal issue, that none of us live or die to ourselves. We need each other. Pastor Jack says how vulnerable we all are by the, uh, to the lying ploys of the enemy's deception. Listen, even supposing there is a wisdom in not bothering anyone else with our personal needs or problems. That's pride. I want to bother you with my personal need. I want to bother you with my problem. Because I want you to pray for me. I want you to pray for my family. I want you to pray for my baby Ashley. I want you to pray for my grandbaby Parker. I want you to pray for my wife. Will you pray for me? As you go about living and preaching preaching the word of God, and we preach in word and in deed, do not forget to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And do not forget to ask them to pray for you. We're in a war. A war that we must fight together through the power of prayer and through the power of the spoken word of God. Will you decide today to preach the gospel? Will you join with me today in lifting up prayer for the body of Christ? Hey everyone, I hope that you enjoyed our podcast for today. If you would like to give us a praise report or request prayer for something, you can email us at amen at r4sq.org.